China's population lives in the big coastal cities of the east, like Beijing and Shanghai. But away from the heavily populated east, heading west to the outer provinces of Tibet, Xinjiang and Yunnan, the more diverse and mysterious this country becomes. Here, the harsh, unforgiving landscapes forge strong, resourceful people with unique lifestyles and heritage. Even in these remote regions, the winds of change are blowing hard. The future's arriving fast as China's secret lands are revealed. Far to the southwest of Beijing, China touches the Himalayas. An empire of mountains carved out by massive rivers into sheer valleys and dense subtropical jungles. This is the lush province of Yunnan. It covers an area even larger than Germany and supports a population of 48 million. They may all share the same home, but here at the crossroads of six nations, the people are as diverse as you can get. 25 distinct ethnicities live here, more than anywhere else in China. Over thousands of years, the natural barriers in this remote southwestern frontier have created isolated fortresses of culture, incubating some of the world's most extraordinary ways of life. Nestled in the rugged mountains near the border of Myanmar is Changyuan, a small county of 180,000, home to the mysterious Wa people. Wa means mountain folk. Living in secret among these steep slopes, they nurtured a unique culture. The worship of many gods, primal rituals, buffalo sacrifice, even headhunting. Today, these secrets are slowly being uncovered. Modern Changyuan is opening its doors and Chiang Kai-jung is unraveling the mysteries of the elusive history of the Wa. Until 1957, the Wa people had no written script for their language. The exact location of Sagangli, the original cave of the Wa people, was therefore never recorded. Only rumors remain. They say Changyuan is close to where it might be found. But one substantive record has survived. Prehistoric rock paintings uncovered in the outskirts of town by a Chinese archaeologist in 1965. <laughs> Chiao 可以离天离地. The Wa's ancestors in Changyuan may have been one of the first to cultivate rice using buffalo. But these plentiful, well irrigated fields are only a recent phenomenon. In the past, the Wa were slash and burn farmers. They didn't use fertilizer, and what little did grow was dry hill rice. 
After the 1950s, the Chinese government reformed the feudal tribes into farming communes, providing the peasants with seeds, tools, and the mastery of water. Today, farmers like Chen Aige lease the land owned by village collectives and reap the rewards. Chen recalls the rapid change in his lifetime. He occasionally takes his old friend out to till the fields, but only to keep himself fit. In downtown Changyuan, decades of modern development is proudly displayed. Water is channeled here for a different reason. What? A festival is brewing. This murky concoction will be the centerpiece of the Morni Hay Carnival. Morni Hay, this festival, is one of the special features. In the past, it was a traditional birth of young children. It started to use the wind. When we put the wind on the wind, it was a miracle. When the people of the wind were working, 没有锅底灰的时候，那泥巴，啊啊，我擦给你锅底灰，我擦给你锅底灰，大家互相擦，摸一脸幸福一年，摸一生幸福终生。But this is no mud from the rice paddy. 这个是我们参与的瓦瓦一盛堂，用那个茶树把它磨磨成粉啊，然后配拢那个瓦出那种原料凉不落，然后还有十几种草药做成的。Twenty metric tons of this raw material. Will be mixed with 20,000 liters of water. In just a few hours, these tubs of good fortune will be emptied. Before the main event, Changyuan's Monihei Plaza hosts an inter village performing arts competition. The many clans of the Wa were once separated by sheer mountain ridges. With little contact, secluded villages created their own distinct clothing, song, and dance. Like many on the stage, 42-year-old Li Yigai is no professional dancer. She's taken the day off from working her family's land, where she grows rice, corn, and tobacco. We represent the Nolan. Transcription Lee knows this friendly contest is just a warm-up. The villagers take their places, standing by for the pinnacle of the Monihei Carnival. The wooden drum is the most sacred symbol of Wa culture. They believe it sends their wishes to the gods. It's accompanied by the mesmerizing hair dance. 
a celebration of female beauty and maturity. Before the dancers finish, someone jumps the gun and opens the floodgates. Today's Morning Hape is accompanied by synthetic drums and amplified DJs. But its traditional meaning hasn't been lost. Mud on a child brings safety and health. For Grandpa, mud wishes them a long life. Young lovers might use it to show their affection. And for women, black is a sign of beauty. But only one rule applies. The dirtier, the crazier, the better. Yunnan was once considered a rural backwater of China. Memories of isolated, remote, and poor ethnic minorities are already being washed away. Modern Yunnan is harnessing its cultural and biological diversity in a new era of high-tech, sustainable development. The provincial capital, Kunming, is one of China's fastest-growing cities with a population of 6.7 million. It sits almost 2,000 meters above sea level on the Yunnan-Guizhou Plateau. Kunming's mild highland climate has earned it the nickname Spring City. Here, flowers bloom all year round, an opportunity that cunning traders have seized. The Donan Flower Center. Six billion flowers a year are sold under this roof. About 12,000 every minute. After sundown, the buyers make their move. Flowers stay fresher at night and can be prepared for shipping in time for the morning flights. After examining today's harvest, Powell makes his way to the auction hall. But it's not the kind of auction that first comes to mind. Three digital clocks tick down in price. 
The first person to hit the button wins the lot. Each deal is made in seconds. With three offers to look at simultaneously and new requests coming in on his phone, Howe is looking remarkably relaxed. <laughs> While traders around the world make split-second decisions on the stock market, here in Yunnan, the most lucrative secrets are living things. In southern Yunnan, Herkai, a village of just 4,000, guards a natural treasure more precious than gold. One that grows in the Bulung Mountains. The Lahu are nomadic mountain people, a minority in China of about half a million. They were once known for their skill at hunting tigers. But these days, their targets are unmoving and far more valuable. Nawa is the Lahu guardian of ancient tea trees. Here lives the king of tea trees. They say he's over a thousand years old. The late 90s saw a wave of wealthy connoisseurs willing to pay a premium for such rare provenance. In two decades, tea prices have risen a hundredfold. Unlike harvesting tea from young plantations, this work requires a higher set of skills. Lahu society is remarkably egalitarian. Men and women all share the same social standing. Only one thing commands respect age. Ninety-one year old Nagur has been walking three kilometers a day and climbing tea trees from even before the Second World War. <laughs> Naga still harvests the same trees. 
and returns to the same humble home as she has for 80 years and has rarely stepped outside this village. The bustle of construction sweeps through her kai. Dirt roads are paved. Aging shacks make way for mansions. But for Nagur, happiness is still a cup of tea and an open fire. The raw leaves collected in the Bulang Mountains are made into a prized variety of tea. Pu'er tea, named after the nearby city where it was first made. Fresh leaves are roasted in giant woks, then pressed into cakes and left to age, developing complex flavors over time. Like the best single malt whiskies, it can take a decade for Pu'er tea to reach its full potential. The township of Nakerli in Pu'er was the important stop in a vast trading network. The ancient Tea Horse Road. It spanned 3,000 kilometers through the Sichuan Mountains to Tibet and beyond. The Tea Horse Road is named after the ancient trade of Chinese tea for Tibetan war horses. Not as you'd expect, because tea was carried on horseback. In fact, as recently as 70 years ago, you could still see human tea porters on these narrow mountain paths. Some would haul up to 160 kilos on their backs. After a thousand years of use, nature has reclaimed most of the ancient tea horse road. Now tea moves at a much quicker pace. And in Pu'er, a new dark infusion is taking hold. Coffee. Pu'er's humid climate and fertile environment rivals the best coffee-growing regions in the world. But coffee is a relatively young stranger in tea country. This is a Dong Xu Xiang has seen the industry expand quickly over the last 20 years. Almost all of China's coffee is grown in Pu'er. Since 2009, coffee consumption in the country has more than quadrupled, driven by a younger, cosmopolitan generation. In Pu'er, the booming industry now involves over a million people. Oh. 
我们茶叶已经摘完了，做结束了，来打工，整咖啡。我们梦中町咖啡饮主要是采用有机模式，用自己的牧场的牛粪，还有那个咖啡果皮，做了我们自己的有机肥。我们的工人都是从云南省各个部分、各个地州过来的，有很多都是少数民族。公司提供了住房、水电、交通，还有他们子女的就学问题。农村合作资料也是我们公司帮他们全部都办了。工人在这里可以无忧无虑的跟我们管好咖啡。让世界很多朋友都不知道，我有好咖啡，让我们做的越来越好，让普洱的咖啡，全世界的人都知道吧。One point two million die live in China, a Buddhist ethnicity closely related to the people of Laos and Thailand. From as early as the sixth century BC, these successful rice cultivators have lived in the lush lowlands and river valleys of Yunnan. The Dai believe that water is the source of all life. Every new year in the unique Dai calendar is marked with the famous water splashing festival. But hidden away in Menglian, a tiny unknown county of 135,000, a unique take on the festival is about to kick off. Here, the Nan Lei River will be the focal point of the Holy Fish Festival. Legend has it the people of Menglian once enraged the god of grains, who punished them with severe famine. The fish god took pity and sacrificed himself as food for the people. Around 50,000 visitors have come to see the festival highlight, a fishing competition that will break the scale. The Holy Fish Festival kicks off with a traditional dragon boat race. Brothers San Meng and Yi Zhang are the home team, representing the Dai town of Na Yun. The Nayun team falls far behind. But in this atmosphere, it's hard to separate winners from losers. This festival is a year-long festival. We are very excited about this festival. This festival is the most popular festival in Menglian. This festival is the most popular festival. Back at home, the boy's father is gearing up for the main event. Back at home, the boy's father is gearing up for the main event. Back at home, the boy's father is gearing up for the main event. 
Boar is no stranger to catching fish. In his youth, he used traditional dye fishing techniques to make a living. The fish he caught would be smoked and sold at the market for a mere five cents per carton. Boar struggled to break free of poverty. But he soon benefited from the government's many agricultural reforms. In 2006, farmers and fishermen no longer needed to pay tax to the government, ending a two and a half thousand year practice. Boar was able to save up for this house in the heart of Nayun and raise three healthy sons. Bo Ai Hambiang no longer needs to fish for survival. Today, it's all about reaping the rewards from a lifetime of hard work. But it seems he's late for the party. The fishing frenzy has already begun. Over 10,000 people swarm on a two-kilometer stretch of the Nanle River. No time for fishing rods here. Men and women come face to face with their prey, baskets and nets at the ready. Some are here to bring home as many fish as possible. Others are in it for the prestige of catching a whopper. There are plenty of professionals. As for the beginners, Bo is more than happy to show how it's done. Luck is something he's short on today. But he has one thing the masses don't. An intimate understanding of the Nanle River, where he's been fishing for half a century. Here, in the deep end, Boar is right at home. After a bountiful day, monks lead the ceremony of 1,000 lights. Illuminating the town's golden temple. The Holy Fish Festival marks the passing of the Buddhist Dai New Year. People flock to the river, lotus flower lanterns in hand, praying for the future or remembering the past. They release their floating candles and light the way to another year. The 
今天拿了一万，大概二十斤，分到就了，送归新家。今天过得更好，过得更开心。One last ritual closes the Holy Fish Festival. A chance for all to release life back into the Nan Lei. Beginning around the 10th century AD, fertile rivers like this one nurtured the rise of powerful Dai kingdoms. Further east, Straddling the banks of the Mekong, known in China as the Lanchang River, lies the heart of a once expansive dominion, Sichuan Bana. The city of Jinghong was the center of the Sichuan Bana Dai Kingdom for nearly 800 years. Though the Dai still make up the majority of the region's 1.1 million inhabitants, the huge influx of Han Chinese since the 1950s is rapidly changing the face of the town. Professor Zhu Liangwen has made it his life's mission to protect the traditional spirit of the Dai. His weapon? Houses. 盖房子很容易，但是如何把这种房盖起，又能够使老百姓满意，又用新的材料，又保留传统形式，我一辈子研究的就是这个东西。Classic Dai houses can still be seen all across Yunnan. According to legend, the design was inspired by the movements of a peacock. The roof repels monsoon rain on all sides. Like a peacock with its wings spread out and head to the ground, the living area stands on stilts to protect from flooding and mosquito-borne disease. Space beneath the house is traditionally kept open for storage or animals, and in that space lies a hole in the plan. The house is not old; the wood is also very expensive. 老百姓盖房怎么办？所以产生了砖楼，砖的楼就不好，底层不好架空了。即使有少量架空，它非常危险，一地震很弱的。所以最后他们干脆就盖成了汉出那种平顶房。这个跟傣出房的特色完全消失了。所以在这种情况下，我们和当地，所以后来我们才建立了一个研究课题。现在所在的就是曼吉法村，也就是我们二零零四年新建的第一个完整的城寨。Using a special reinforced concrete system, Professor Zhu and his team designed an entire village that satisfied all three demands: cost-effective, earthquake-safe, and quintessentially Dai. 当然，在中原地区根本看不到这些东西了。那可以说几千年文化的一个呃传统，它留下来了。二十年来呢，不仅是这个城寨，好多城寨都按照这个城寨做了。可是我的发展发展到这个时候，又有新的材料了。If bamboo die houses are generation one, wood houses generation two, and reinforced concrete generation three, then Zawinbing village. Is what Professor Zhu calls the fourth generation, made of lightweight steel and natural fiber. We have many Xiang Jiao Lin. Xiang Jiao is that wood. It is dried after its wood. It is dried. 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 These die-style houses spring up from recycled material at miraculous speed. Just ten days from start to finish. So, the traditional building and the traditional 
它就是传统文化那个载体，这些东西不保护好。对于我们的民族文化来和我们这个中华的传统文化来说，是很大的损失，也就是把我们情感上很多东西丢失掉了。所以现在你看，我退休以后，老实说比过去更忙了，这个一直停不下来，就是过去研究东西，现在正好派上用场，所以也感到是一个很好的时机。Diverse ethnic minorities make up more than two-thirds of Sichuang Bana's population. This rich multicultural exchange is on full display at the Jimao Market. Aside from the usual fruits, vegetables and meat, this bazaar offers exotic goods for those with daring taste buds. This is the biggest one. 集贸市场啊，一些本地的特有的一些蔬菜、一些品种比较多，所以平时呢都是到这个市场来买菜，就想要做点好吃的。Twenty-four years of living here has made Zhang Hong an expert in local Thai cuisine. 呃，这个是傣族的芭蕉叶包烧的小鱼，还有芭蕉花包的肉。然后这个呢是青苔，是江里面捞上来的。煎着吃，炒着吃，然后呢，蘸糯米饭，想不想吃？想吃想,想吃馍。想吃馍的。嗯，我想吃洋芋。<笑>这个东西是蚂蚁打的，蜂蛾的，这是小蜜蜂的蜂蛾。现在生吃是甜的，有点甜味，然后可以炒吃，油炸着吃。更想吃的。啊，好嘛。多少一碗？Zhang is stocking up for a feast because today his 11-year-old daughter will challenge the raging currents of the Lanchang River. My name is Zhang Mengjia. I'm five years old. My dream is to participate in the Olympics. Zhang Mengjia has been training seriously with this swim club for the past two years. Every week, she'll juggle several events. Every week, she'll juggle several events. Every week, she'll juggle several events. Every week she'll juggle several hours of after-school swim time with a steadily increasing academic workload. Both are equally important. Meng Jia's sporting talents may earn her bonus points in China's competitive education system, and might even land her a place in a prestigious sporting school. We, these athletes, are all from the school teams. They are selected by our Xishuang Banna. Today, it's a special lesson. Out of the pool and up against nature. They'll swim from the Jinghong Old Bridge across the 260-meter-wide river to the opposite bank near the new bridge. The mighty Lanchang can rush as fast as 10 kilometers per hour. It's not a challenge to take lightly. 当时我在水里看着水很浑浊，水流又湍急，我就想自己能不能游过去。水很深，也看不下去，每次都要换气和闷闷水进去，都看着河底都都深不见底。我就害怕突然有个水草之类的，或者说是有蛇之类的来缠住我的脚。我当时挺害怕的，但是看着伙伴们都在身边，就有一种安全感。因为我们在处都是生活在的河边、江边，从小我们就开始抓鱼啊、摸虾，所以学会游泳啊。来到江边来游嘛，是你的，主要是心理作用嘛。
。特别高兴，高兴自己在这里上了啊，没被冲下去。啊，再跑一会儿没力气上来了。It's not just raw physical strength. But the courage to conquer her own fears that has brought Mungja past the finish line, enough to make her father proud. Hey, so many years. Very small, his dream is this. The Olympics. He can be on the television broadcast of the Olympics. He can see people's movements and correct his own movements. It feels very fast. I tell him how to. 蛙泳是怎么换气，手是怎么劈的，所以感觉有天赋，要努力啊！对不对？如果想要参加奥运会的话，首先挑战自己，后来训练加量，到后面再一步一步的往上爬上去，尽量拿得冠军，为中国争光。Just 80 kilometers down the Lanchang, big business is flourishing. Guanlei Port is where landlocked Yunnan bridges its way to Southeast Asia. Guanlei Gang, as we are the only one in Yunnan, 呃，水陆可岸，我们可以从这里出去的货物可以到达六个国家，到缅甸、老挝、泰国，包括越南的好多货物都可以从这里向东南亚地区输送。River freight is increasingly important in China, more energy efficient and environmentally friendly than road or rail. Ship captain. Huan Xingxiang has been sailing the Lanchang for more than 20 years. I was Once his full load of garlic is locked down, he'll set off on a nine-hour journey to Thailand. Hello,你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。你好。
a place inhospitable to most life. Yet for at least five millennia, humans lived here in extreme isolation, surviving on very little. Research has shown that in their seclusion, they've evolved genetic traits not found in other humans to cope with this severe environment. Now these hardy people are adapting to another great change. Modernity. Only three million people live in the Tibet Autonomous Region, an area almost the size of Western Europe. Just over one person per square kilometer. In this vast emptiness, all roads lead to one city, Lhasa. The Mecca of Tibetan Buddhism. Lhasa literally translates to the place of the gods. It's also a place for 280,000 residents. Before the 7th century, the Tibetan plateau was occupied by a disarray of small rival kingdoms. The great Sungzen Gampur united the surrounding clans and became the first emperor of the vast Tibetan Empire. It was a formative time for Tibet. Although the empire only lasted 220 years, Sungzin Gampur's legacy still dominates the old town of Lhasa today. He constructed the first buildings on the site of the Grand Portala Palace. And he's credited with bringing a major religion to Tibet, Buddhism. Here is the holiest place of all, the Jokang Temple built by Sungzhan Gampo 1,300 years ago. Every morning, thousands of pilgrims perform a kora, a meditative clockwise circling of a sacred site. Some have walked for months on a holy pilgrimage, culminating in this haze of incense smoke and spinning prayer wheels. Thousands of kilometers on foot prostrating and reciting scripture every few steps. On the bustling markets of Barkor Street, surrounding the temple, a Tibetan entrepreneur watches the pilgrims closely, scanning the distinctive styles of clothing gathered here from all corners of Tibet. Thirty-three-year-old Konshok Tashi has a dream to take traditional Tibetan fashion into a new international era. Even among Tibetans, Tashi stands out. It's not just the workout gear that he wears for every occasion. Hi, it's also his unmistakable <laughs> After working as a police officer, a website editor, and an art curator, he entered the world of fashion without any training. It's a big day for Tashi. Tonight, he'll reveal the new season's designs on the catwalk. Yeah, 
In seven years, Konchok Yitashi has grown from one staff to 13. Tashi's partner, Wu Qian, plays a key role. She balances Tashi's creativity with her own practicality. They rush between their converted apartments on Barcor Street, putting together last-minute adjustments. But with 10 hours to go, Tashi has doubts about the lineup. The show starts at 8 o'clock. Before then, he'll need to sketch, sew, and accessorize his masterpiece from scratch. Boutique shops selling traditional chuba robes are common on Barcourt Street. But Tashi is virtually the only Tibetan attempting to bring global styles into his locally inspired designs. Wow, Tashi has handed in his design, a slick Western style professional suit, which will be paired with intricate Tibetan accessories. It's now up to the sewing team to furiously assemble the headline garment. Only five hours remain. Tashi must head to the venue without the dress. He's already committed the sin of keeping Wu Qian waiting. It's okay. <laughs> Now <laughs> With only two hours to spare, the key dress arrives. Ganhao, <laughs> 他对我也非常苛刻as the models, musicians, and technicians do their final checks, the scale of Tashi's ambition becomes visible.
，我们一起来打造一个感觉。是什么感觉？海纳百川的，充满创造精神的，拉萨。南琉璃的时尚。我从刚开始的十几件衣服，慢慢的做过来，最主要的原因是因为得到了很多人的认可。哇！你猜的话，我觉得哪一段最好？你猜的话，我猜。嗯，我说话的时候。对呀。这边一下子说，哇，好紧张。希望通过这样一个系列，我能够做到，就是把西藏传统的服饰，然后更多的融入到我自己的设计，做到就像我一直强调的这个 front to back, beyond to back， 说的好不好？哎，这边特别好。<笑>是城市的杨巴金。For centuries, Tibetan nomads have roamed these valleys, grazing their yaks on the fertile grass. But the ephemeral lifestyle of a wanderer is becoming a thing of the past. Beginning in 2006, the Chinese government subsidized permanent housing to provide a more stable life for nomads. Though their children now attend school, work is still the same for the older generation. No, don't you just? Don't you know? I'm sorry, Lord. Don't you know? I'm sorry, Lord. Don't you just? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lord. Don't you get? Just don't you shake us along here, dear friend? Coffee, girl. No, I'm not here. TV, get coffee. You're not feeling too much. You're not here. Too much, girl. Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? There's something unusual about where these nomads have chosen to settle. Nearby, the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates collide and fuel the fires of the Yangbajing hot springs. Here, the largest geothermal power station in China dominates the vista. Magma-heated water from 1,000 meters underground is piped into the plant, generating enough cheap and clean energy to power 50,000 Tibetan households. It's a reliable year-round supply for Lhasa and the surrounding villages. The local herders still burn yak dung for heat in winter. But electricity and modern appliances have replaced their cooking fires. 
네 오만 성격도는지 약고 희월을 드는 날 보고를 안 내만하네 오만 들러게 하다. 네도 마시는 마티 희월님이 희월님 너무 또 너무 또는 모티게 샤스 녀남 게 샤트. 네맨 너무 내리니 너무 말은 희월조리. 가래 야즈. Some things never change, like the daily cup of yak butter tea, a salty beverage full of pungent fats. It provides vital calories and nutrients, and is believed to combat altitude sickness. Cold, thin air may test the limits of human endurance, but these are ideal conditions for solar panels. The Yang Bajing Solar Park was completed in 2012. The intensity of solar radiation in Tibet is second only to the Sahara Desert. But because a low temperature enhances the performance of photovoltaic cells, this may well be the best place on Earth to generate solar power. But there's something else looking to the heavens at Yangbajing. Something that's helping to solve the mysteries of the universe. Professor Huang Jing from the Institute of High Energy Physics at the Chinese Academy of Sciences and her research associate are visiting one of the most cutting edge research facilities in the world. One that proves science is not glamorous. Professor Huang represents an international team of 76 researchers from Japan and China on the Tibet AS Gamma experiment. Their mission? To uncover the puzzling origin of high energy cosmic rays, charged particles from space that bombard the Earth's atmosphere. These extraterrestrial particles travel close to the speed of light, some with an energy millions of times greater than anything we've achieved on Earth. What in space could have caused such unimaginable acceleration? The types of cosmic ray they're investigating are some of the most powerful and rare only a few particles hitting per square meter per year. The Tibet AS Gamma experiment is situated at the precise altitude where these rays are easiest to detect, and there's no shortage of the flat open spaces needed to cast a wider net. 经过关电杯灯管，它会转换成电信号，从电缆线传到我们的那个数据采集系统里面。Building and maintaining a facility in the severe environment of Yangbajing is not a job for the faint of heart. Professor Huang may be an outsider to the plateau, but she's armed with a very Tibetan sense of devotion. Professor Huang 
，这个铅板就有三百公斤，都是我们自己搬过来的。所有的这些电缆线，你大约有八百多根的，因为碰上沙尘暴。我们每个人都是跪在地底，地底下跪在这里，一根一根、一米一米的拉过来，所以非常的艰难。Even more remarkable than her endurance at the top of the world is Professor Huang's climb to the top of China's academic circles. Women hold less than 10% of all professorships in China. 我当时的时候，我记得整个实验组。就我是唯一的一个女性，当时对自己的压力也很大，非常大。最努力的时候，我记得是，呃，四天三夜吧，我就没有闭过眼睛了。我估计是这个背子，就是背子上面有可能有虚汗。我自己是很喜欢这个研究的，我就不会轻而易举的放弃。越是很困难的东西，我就越越越努力的去，一定要把它拿到，一定要把它做出来。我第一次来杨八井的时候，感觉西藏是一个很神秘的地方。我们就是满怀着这种好奇心跟神秘，以最快的速度出最好的物理成果，走到真正的走到世界的最前沿。The first light of dawn stirs the sleeping pilgrims at Drepung Monastery, once the largest monastery in Tibet. They've endured a cold and rainy night to be at the front row of a grand opening. Today is a very special day, the Jiaodong Day. Monks have been cloistered inside Drepung Monastery for the past month. Their reason? To avoid stepping on insects as they emerge from the ground during summer. They're practicing, as much as possible, the first Buddhist precept to abstain from killing. Now it's about time to end their seclusion. Today we're at 晒佛，然后在我们在这大大殿的这门口，就等他们出来。It's a golden opportunity for young Pak Mutashi, a postgraduate student at Tibet University, specializing in a centuries-old Tibetan art known as Tangka. The emerging monks are about to share with the public. One of the largest Tangka paintings in existence. Tangka is a highly formalized style of painting, on cotton or silk scrolls, with Buddhist deities as a main feature. From as early as the 11th century, they were rolled up and carried by spiritual teachers. To spread the word of Buddha across the plateau, a well-made tanka is believed to embody the deity and transmit a living presence to those who view it. At the age of 22, Tashi must study intensively if he's to channel these spiritual powers. 音乐方面什么都跳舞蹈方面我都有所接触，但是唐卡这门艺术来讲，绘画过程是特别艰苦。我现在所画的是一幅完整的释迦牟尼佛像。Strict rules have been set in stone centuries ago by Buddhist masters. They govern proportions, stance, shape. Even hand positions. 一分一毫都不能有错。花了三四十多年的大师还在练习这个。In Tanka, adherence to tradition is the greatest virtue.
盖快要出来了。要开始了，要开始了。The thick roll of cloth weighs about half a ton, and must be shouldered up the mountain to the display platform. The monks will need all the help they can get. Now,这个展覆的一个过程,每幅汤盖都一样,先把身边的袈裟还有景色全部画完,才点眼睛,然后这幅盖一层图,到了时刻,盖展出的时候,它就会把那个图拉上去,对,开始展了,开始展了。The monumental tanka is 40 meters long, as large as three basketball courts combined. It's only been displayed once before, when it was made in 2016. 30 artists toiled for two years to complete it. Thousands swarm the tanka display anxious to get close before the monks roll it back into the monastery at noon. Silk hardar scarves are a symbol of purity and respect. They convey the prayers of the people who have camped out all night to be here. Jinjianfu就是尼洛夫,正下方的那几幅画,属于那种护法神,上面那些都是一些喇嘛,完全要打雷啊这些。This grand tankar presentation marks the beginning of the Shodun festival, also known as the yogurt festival. In a tradition from the 11th century, lay people celebrate the reappearance of the monks by holding a banquet featuring yogurt. Norbalinka, the Dalai Lama's summer palace, is at the center of festivities. Its vast gardens open to a mass of holidaying families. While other operas around the world have a niche audience, Lamo, or Tibetan opera, is still very popular among common folk today. A blend of song, dance, acrobatics, and narrative chanting, heavily rooted in Buddhist teachings. Lo Sung Tashi has been performing and teaching Tibetan opera for 25 years. Much like Tanka, this is an art obtained only through uncompromising discipline.
Over the next three days, he will sing and chant almost continuously for 10 hours a day. While the city of Lhasa relaxes under the summer sun, a Tonkar artist in training is about to face his most daunting task yet. The university has arranged for Pat Mutashi to meet his teacher's teacher. 76-year-old Dampa Rabtin is the oldest and most respected Tanka master in Tibet today. A living cultural treasure. Jen Dampa Menkuru,特别紧张了,那只腐化,它会不会沮丧,就喝在这几杯,就花的不好,我就特别担心的就是这个。Master Dampa's grandfather was the official portraitist of the previous Dalai Lama in the early 1900s. Tesan 年纪那么高了，然后画的时候，他手一点也不动。我们绘画讲究主要是手和笔尖，手就是呃他的生命。丹巴老师到现在了，他还是保持着他的这种生命。But for Master Dampa, true Tonka is a dying tradition. On Barkor Street, mass-produced Tonkas emblazon the shop walls catching the eye of tourists. A far cry from the art he spent his whole life preserving. <laughs> the precious hour with Master Dampa leaves a lasting impression on Pak Mutashi, the newest link in the chain of tradition. The unique personality of Lhasa lies in this interface between the old and the young. But beyond the capital is an even greater contrast. A descent in altitude of just 600 meters reveals a world of difference. Many of Asia's great rivers snake through this mysterious land in southeastern Tibet, home to China's largest virgin forest. Nyingchi, a prefectural city, straddles the craggy terrain 400 kilometers east of Lhasa. It's been called the Switzerland of China. Nyingchi's primitive forests 
are still a lifeline for the villagers of remote Chogao. Lo Sang Chopao is on the hunt for something as valuable as it is elusive. It only appears for two months in summer. Hi. The Matsutake mushroom, long used in folk medicine for its magical health properties. Recent studies by Chinese pharmacologists have uncovered scientific proof of its antibacterial and cancer-fighting effects. Artificial cultivation of Matsutake mushrooms is yet to be successful. Its sensitivity to environmental conditions and short fruiting season gives it a mythical rarity. The highest grades can retail for 2,000 US dollars per kilo on the international market. Yeah, that's it. Shemu Chama Sunsrachta. Three Shemu Chama Rachta. Yeah, Manala no go. Janlo Shidelas go Yurta. De ta meto nga. The Matsutake mushroom has been collected and casually eaten by these families for generations. But it's the past few decades of improved global access that has infused its lucrative value. A new high-speed motorway will soon connect Nyingchi and Lhasa and accelerate the influx of wealth. But there's one major roadblock in the way. Mila Mountain. Here, the world's hardiest road builders are working 24 hours a day to surmount the insurmountable. This is Mila Shan Sido, Chuku Zodong. She's been in the last 1,800 meters, Zhang Xin has been called in from Chongqing for his expertise in building tunnels. Never in his 15-year career has he encountered one as difficult as this. 4,700 meters above sea level, 5.8 kilometers long, the Mila Mountain Tunnel will be the world's highest road tunnel. But they're well overdue. Two years into construction, 
the team have only dug 70% of the way. The oxygen level here is so low, two breaths only count for one. Chen Zerong, from Zhejiang province, is responsible for the health and safety of his fellow workers. A huge weight to bear in such extreme conditions. Low oxygen is just one of many handicaps. Winters at Mila Mountain last for nine months, with temperatures plummeting to minus 30 degrees Celsius. After digging the first 400 meters, the team encountered a crippling problem. Groundwater. At its worst, 39,000 cubic meters of water per day flooded into the tunnel. Enough to fill 15 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Pumps must run continuously to clear a path for the crew. But the excess water also weakens the soft rock causing the tunnel to sink dangerously. Despite the monumental challenges, the construction team still holds a clean safety record. And work must go on. Fazu 我从心里上就是能把我们这个血景贯通，我感觉很感动，很感谢他们。The high worker turnover rate on this site is a challenge for Zhang Xin. Some only last two days before quitting, but he and his core team have persevered from the beginning. 我老婆，第一个是坚决不同意了，老婆哭着不能去。那个地方去，他认为就是这地方很恐怖，很可怕。来的时候你可能就是晚上睡觉，你就会，第二天也许你就不在了。因为我们是个团队，我们这个团队在一起已经有一二十年了。难道人家都来就我不来？谢谢老
overlooking Yingqi City. Biri Mountain is believed to have been a meditation spot for the legendary Padmasumbhava, founder of Tibet's most ancient school of Buddhism. A modern boardwalk supports the older pilgrims on their regular five-kilometer kura around the religious site. China has invested heavily into infrastructure, financial aid, and education for Tibet in the past 50 years. In 2017, Tibet became the fastest growing region in China. Here, on the world's highest plateau, human life ventures into the extraordinary. These mystical people are beginning to open up and share their secrets. For them, intense devotion is part of everyday life. Not only to religion, but to unbridled creativity and world-beating progress. This is a place that's growing and changing as rapidly as the rest of China. <laughs> and in the vastness of Tibet, there's plenty of room for the future. In the far reaches of China is the country's largest province, Xinjiang a land of contrast and extremes. Scorching desert, bountiful harvest, frozen peaks, lush grasslands, a kaleidoscope of cultures, rich history and heritage, and the promise of a prosperous future as Xinjiang rises again. Xinjiang is massive, about the same size as Iran, twice as big as Turkey, and borders eight Asian countries. Everything here is vast, from the Taklumakan Desert, the second largest shifting sand desert in the world, to the Bayun Bulak grasslands that seem to roll on forever. The climate in the Bayun Bulak is almost as dry as the neighboring desert. But the grassland is fed by countless streams and rivers falling from the surrounding mountains. For centuries, this has been a home of Xinjiang's Mongol population, providing ample pasture for their livestock and the wide open spaces that underpin their nomadic lifestyle.
horses are central to Mongol culture and are treated with great affection and respect. In fact, it's been said a Mongol without a horse is only half a man. For young Naingtai, riding a horse is as natural as walking. And even at his tender age, he's a champion in the saddle. To city dwellers, camping out in a remote valley for months at a time may seem a harsh and difficult lifestyle, but the Mongols take it in their stride. The rhythm of this life is slow and steady and centered around family, horses and livestock in that order. To the Mongol, the horse is more than an animal. They're constant companions, symbols of freedom and well-being, essential for work and play. Horse racing is a favorite sport, and Nayingtai is about to test his skills at the annual celebration of Mongol culture. It's festival time on the Bayung Bulak. The big annual event on the Bayung Bulak grassland is the Nadam Festival. A 10 day celebration of Mongolian culture and sport that starts with great pomp and ceremony. Historically, the Nadam focuses on the so-called three manly skills. Horse racing, wrestling, and archery. Embracing skills that Mongolians have honed in battle over the centuries. These days, women can compete in archery and horse racing, but the wrestling remains men only. Mongolian wrestling dates back as early as the 13th century, when Genghis Khan ruled the steppes. A military sport for improving the strength and stamina of his troops.
Today, it's the most popular sport for Mongolians. The rules are simple. Last man standing wins. So Before the horse racing properly gets underway, other events demand great riding skills too. Naying Tai warms up for his races by competing on the obstacle course, where riders try to get round all the strategically placed drums in the quickest time possible. Naying Tai isn't placed in this competition and decides to sit the next one out. It's the crowd favorite. Contestants gallop towards scarves on the ground, bending down to try to pick them up. Some riders make it look ridiculously easy. Others, not so much. Perhaps it's just as well Naying Tai gave it a miss. Horse racing at the Nadam involves several races over various distances. All a vigorous test of speed and endurance for horse and jockey. Even though Naying Tai has won several Nadam titles over the years, he's been training hard for his specialist event, a breakneck five kilometers. When he's racing, Naying Tai is only concerned with the very basics. Steering his horse around the course and hanging on for dear life. Naying Tai is a rider of great skill and determination. As the race goes on, he opens up a big lead on the rest of the field. The result is never in doubt. Naying Tai adds another Nadam title to his impressive collection. And finally, gets to enjoy the festivities as a spectator.
desert dominates large parts of Xinjiang, like the Taklamakan, which literally translates to, you can get into, but will never get out. And yet, for centuries, this was one of the main highways of the fabled Silk Road, the ancient network of trading routes between the East and the West. But it wasn't just silk that passed along these routes. Almost any commodity thinkable began moving across Eurasia. By braving the wilds of Xinjiang, traders made their fortunes or died trying. In the East, the Silk Road started in Xi'an, the ancient capital of China, and went west over land through the heart of Asia onto Europe and ending in Venice and Genoa. In Xinjiang, the main northern route of the Silk Road wove in between so-called oasis towns like Hami and Turpan, and one of the most famous of all, Zhaohe. Zhaohe was built on an island where two rivers met. Walled by steep 30-meter cliffs, it was a natural fortress and home to a thriving city. And thanks to the arid desert climate, the earthen ruins are still remarkably well preserved. Xu Dongliang is an expert on ancient relics who knows Zhao He well. He's a master of restoring ancient silk artifacts recovered from ruined cities like this. Zhao in fact, Zhao He was a major Buddhist center up until the 9th century. Along with the temples, there were monasteries and large stupas where Buddhist artifacts were kept. When the overland Silk Road was replaced by maritime trade routes, Zhao He started a slow decline. After a destructive Mongol invasion in the 13th century, the city was finally abandoned. But artifacts left behind, like ancient silk clothing preserved in the dry desert air, provide precious insights into times gone by. At the Institute of Turpan Studies, Mr. Shu reveals the processes involved in silk making. Age-old techniques pioneered in China and held a closely guarded secret for over 2,000 years. First, the silkworm cocoons are boiled in water, so the gum holding the silk fibers together comes off easily. 经过电磁炉把水加热之后呢，我们里面放一点的那个茶砖，这样的话抽出的丝就是带一点点黄色，这样修补文书也好，修补丝绸也好，它就比较协调啊。Once the fibers have been unwound, they're spun into single strands. Typically, each cocoon produces between two and three kilometers of fine silk thread. Every chance he gets, Mr. Shu works on real pieces of Silk Road history. This is a fabric and a silk thread. This is 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 a silk thread. This is
。呃，以前画的一幅就是山西芮城永乐宫的一个壁画，是门神。当时这个壁画里边用的这个线描啊、玻璃颜料了，都非常讲究神的护佑、保护文物的安全。从这个角度来讲，我就把它最后放在这里头。The first job in restoring a silk antique is to figure out where it was made. Not that easy if only scraps remain and they're thousands of years old. But authenticity is crucial. Discovering where an antique was made and how will determine the methods used in its repair. This is a vintage Astana antique repair kit. At the time we got this piece, it was in a bag with very dirty and dirty pieces of antique. The first job in restoring the antique after a year of repairs and cleaning, we found it to be a piece. 一个衣服，就是过去穿那个长衣，我们叫长衣。Restoring the ancient coat, like all the recovered treasures, takes meticulous technique and infinite patience. 它这个，现在我正在做的这一步，就是用铺针的方法，引一根单丝，然后呢，把它用那个回针的方法给它进行一个针头的一个固定。固定之后拉一根长线过来，把收针的地方也做一个固定，每隔三毫米到两毫米，把它钉一下，这样的话它这个口子就不会再开。最重要的就是把失传的东西给它衔接起来，再把它继续传播下去，它就构成了整个这个文明的一个传承的一个链条。使这个链条一环扣一环，不要断裂。生命是通过文物来延续下去的。In contrast to the ruins of Zhao He, another northern city has undergone spectacular growth. Especially in recent years, Urumqi is the capital of Xinjiang, and also has the distinction of being the furthest city from the sea in the world, about 2,400 kilometers from the nearest ocean. Despite that, it's officially designated a port, which allows it to offer lower tax rates to help attract business and investment. But there's a much bigger picture. Urumqi's dramatic development is largely driven by the Belt and Road Initiative. Launched in 2013, this is China's visionary plan to create a new Silk Road, transforming the old overland and maritime trade routes through massive investment in infrastructure. Under Belt and Road, Urumqi is fast becoming one of China's most important transport hubs. Handling Chinese exports on the new and improved rail networks to Central Asia and Europe. Now, the Xinjiang Railway Station is located in Urumqi. 在同国际的沟通上来说，乌鲁木齐可以说是我国“一带一路”最为重要的一个桥头堡，连接着西方和东方，包括我们经济文化交流的一个疏解点。物资运输这块来说，都是比较重要的一个节点。One of the challenges of building the new railway locally was the natural wind tunnel formed by the mountains between Urumqi and the city of Turpan. The valley is blasted by gales for more than 200 days a year. Caravans of merchants on the old Silk Road were literally blown apart here, and the wind can still be deadly. Urumqi Railway Station is actually 852 km. Of which 400 km are all wind tunnels. The main thing is that the wind is dead, including the wind is broken, the wind is broken, the wind is broken, and the wind is broken. In this road, we built the railway station. 设计和设计了相应的要增加相应的防风设施
，有三百四十五公里，上的是基座式的挡风墙，也为确保动车组的运行安全起到了不可磨灭的作用。But the fierce winds in the region also generate big business. This is Dabanchul, just south of Urumqi, the site of China's first large-scale wind farm and one of the biggest in Asia. An 80-kilometer long and 20-kilometer wide forest of turbines. Its success has inspired the building of large wind farms in other parts of China. And the dramatic growth in the country's wind generation capacity has blown away all previous predictions. There are about 23 million people in Xinjiang, and just under half of them belong to the Uyghur ethnic group. Uyghurs are predominantly Muslim. They started converting in the 10th century when Islam, like so many other things, arrived from the west down the Silk Road. The Uyghurs have a rich culture, including a distinctive musical genre known as mukam a word from Arabic roots meaning place or location. In a village near the northern city of Turpan, this small school band is tuning up for a day's study. And there's a lot to learn. Mukam combines poetry, dance, classical music and folk songs largely played on traditional instruments. These children are studying Mukam during their normal school holidays. Attendance is voluntary and tuition is free. The headmaster says it's the responsibility of the older generations to keep the Mukam heritage alive. The headmaster's grandson, an accomplished Mukha musician himself, is home on holiday from university in Beijing to also teach at the school. Rahmtulmalimdiki, <gülüyor> This style of mukam has 12 separate pieces, all with different rhythms, melodies, and tempos. Playing just one piece can take two hours. Playing all 12 would literally take all day. It's a lifetime's work to master the mukam. That's why starting early is so important. Polatek in Zam Altin, Nima Osdo, Altin, the Halbiatu de Dre, and Mosho Altin, the Halbine, 
Kol keltirip muş altın aldan kirsiniz de buldu cuma. Muşu dersin obdan anlayıp, yakşı ünüp, çolpan bab, hatta bir nakşıga ikiz el ihtimen köylük maşınla keltirip digen gel. Bu altında galiba digen muşu şu cuma. Bunu bir udar mı ne? Ma perde bir udar, iki udar oldu mu? Üçüncüsün ahan, tötüncüsü tek iste bir udar. Töt udar ola bir nakşık. It's a lot of work for these youngsters, especially when they could be enjoying a break from normal school. Bana bu şu nakşıkta töt udar ola hem de. Partiye gel, min rahmet digenli beşini tepedim. Başlansın. But there's clearly something in this ancient musical form that strikes a chord in their young hearts. Maynak bu kalıq için biz kalan yaş evlatlarla muşunu biz hayat vaxtımızda kaldır kuş özümüzde makam çıkıp yedik. Kız Rus her kıl muşu makam çaldıran müzik ya lan üyüttüş. Şuna özlem kızıkladığım bağlılığım için. It's said that the music and dance of Mukam are essential to the Uyghur as eating and drinking. Certainly these talented youngsters have built up quite an appetite and a celebration meal is well deserved. Ha, <gülüyor> Ben Muştab'da 65 yaş girdim. Ben Muş'u sahneye çıksam ya 25 ya 36 yaş. Aynı halde çıkalım hemen. Kağallama mangok şaş uzun ömür kürüyor. O zorunla bizdeki cemiyetimiz Muş'un mukam, miras. Ağırdığınızdan balıra. The city of Turpan and the surrounding area has the distinction of being one of the hottest places on earth. In fact, it's known as China's Fireland. In the long arid summer, temperatures regularly hit well over 40 degrees Celsius. And the searing surface of the sand can be twice as hot. just perfect for the ancient Uyghur medical practice of sand therapy. Something people from all over China visit to experience. Akbar has been coming here every year for the last 12 years. He normally stays 10 days at a time and credits the sand therapy for easing pains in his back, arms, and knees. Even though Akbar is a sand therapy veteran, he's checked every day to make sure he's not overdoing it. Too much puts him at risk of dehydration and heat stroke. And people with high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes have to get medical clearance to take the treatment. <laughs> Hmm. 
Diğer de kadar alametler çıksa, derhal komu kimin için doktorsuz, doktor doktorun mesleği tuycan, hep varsız. Ha, Uygur tibbiyatçılığı 2500 yıldan bu yan Şincan'da halkımızın ki sağlamlığı için hizmet kılan. Uygur tibbiyatçılığı Cungo veten tibbiyatçılığının davalı sürülüğünün birisi bulup boğumlağa, putla, küm, kumu kümün şarkılık kisel davalaydıgan davalaş, Uygur tibbiyatçılığının davalı sürülüğünün birisi. Hem de bu kıl davalı sürülüğünün Bugün yalıgı, rahmat oydluk bugün yalıgı, boyun umut kikisle, mür bugün yalıgı. Akbar is quite at home in the burning sand. Incredibly, he barely raises a sweat. Just a comet, switcher dude, Jordanir. 烫的那种感觉，高寒，十秒、二十秒以后，就你的身体的温度和这个啥啥子温度基本上混合在一起了。我主要是治疗，我就是腰疼、肩椎炎，所以我这边先买针，然后每肩椎炎的时候我把腿
Öz vaxtı da 12 kan tərgibi 24 bir saat rabı doldu. Kan tərgibi kanın tərgibi kurup boğandı ki kurup uzumda 84 bir saniye doldu. Sek tatlıq. Şunda tatlıq oldu. Aşında adaylıyım ben. Grapes are surely one of the treasures of Turpan, but not only for the produce itself. Grape Valley is becoming a favorite tourist destination. The combination of high quality fruit, the romance of vines cascading over trellis, and the old world charm of the local people combine to make a heady brew. Grapes are not the only crop to be successfully grown here. 520,000 hectares of cotton stretch over the horizon. The industry dominates the economy of several parts of Xinjiang, notably the capital Urumqi and the nearby city of Shahertse. Mrs. Young has been working in the cotton industry for been working in the cotton industry for her fields are now harvested by machine. Some plants around the edges are missed and need to be handpicked. One of the main changes is the move away from watering the cotton plants by hand, a time-consuming and wasteful practice, with so much precious water lost through evaporation. The modern solution is to bury tubing to deliver the water down at the roots, drip by drip. The other big change has been the shift to mechanical harvesting. It said one machine can do the work of 2,000 workers each day. And it certainly made Mrs. Young's life much easier. Although Mrs. Young now saves the effort, money and time by using mechanical harvesters, her income is still dependent on how much cotton she can produce. It all comes down to the next few days and she's feeling the pressure. Mr. Shu is very much in demand at harvest time. He owns and operates five harvesting machines, and right now, they're working night and day. 我在这个整个车队里面有一个就是切条作用，这几十台这个棉花车需要我来调配到哪块地。棉花开的速度又非常快，再加上今年天气又非常好，所以这个棉花在很短的时间内，大概在十天左右，这个棉花就集中爆发
看到这个自己的这个丰收的果实走了，开不开心？高产了就很开心。嗯，好吧，那就等着它的吨位出来，你就开心了。<笑>最好的金子是我的棉花。可以，挺好的。你只要是达到满意，呃，嗯、我也，你的满意就是我的满意。Even though some parts of Xinjiang are intensely cultivated, vast areas are wide open. Frontier land. China's very own Wild West. And, appropriately enough, there's even a wild horse here. Not a domestic horse that escaped and went feral, but a truly wild horse. The only species in the world. This is Shavalsky's horse, named after the Russian explorer Nikolai Shavalsky, who described it while on his travels in 1881. Nomadic people of Xinjiang and Mongolia had hunted the horse for centuries for its meat and skin. But in the 20th century, overhunting, loss of habitat, and a series of very severe winters saw Shavalsky's horse declared extinct in the wild. The only surviving members of the species were in European zoos. And by the end of the 1950s, there were just 12 left and only nine capable of breeding. An international effort was launched to save the horse, with captive breeding programs in several zoos worldwide. And here in Xinjiang. This is the vet and his students have to make sure any injuries or diseases are treated fast and effectively. In such a vulnerable population, any fatality is a massive blow. None of Shivalsky's horses bred here have been returned fully to the wild. The closest is a herd moved to a wildlife reserve. Even there, they are closely monitored and given extra feed over the long winter. If the weather is too severe, they're rounded up and returned to the center. It's hoped that one day, the wild horse will once again run completely free. The survival of the Shavalsky's horse is hailed as one of the great comebacks in conservation history. It was truly an international effort, and there are now an estimated 2,000 horses worldwide. 
and 350 here in one of their original homes. The people of Xinjiang may come from different ethnic groups and cultures. They may have different beliefs and interests. but they also have a lot in common. To survive and make a life here, in such an extreme environment, they have to be determined and resilient, with a physical and mental toughness that sets them apart. Their attitudes reflect the landscape, dynamic and strong, big and bold. Xinjiang is a place where the past is respected and the future is embraced. Where the Silk Road, the world's greatest trading route, is being revived in spectacular fashion. This frontier land, so long remote, is fast becoming, once again, a region of influence and opportunity.